I'd like to thank uh, Jarl and uh, Shanin in particular for inviting me and letting me be part of this conference and helping out in organizing it. Um, so let's see. So I had a I gave a tutorial yesterday on uh, conformal prediction. Uh, so I guess that uh, quite a few of you were there and listening to that tutorial. So I think that some of the things that I will be saying here were sort of covered in that tutorial. So for those of you who didn't attend the tutorial, and you, if you find this interesting around yeah, using conformant predictors, then please approach me. And yeah, please approach me if you find anything interesting that you would like to ask. So afterwards, anytime. Um, so, so my talk is mainly around um, interpreting and predicting uh, activities using conformal predictors but I I will have a, sort of a background, I give a quite long background I think and explain a little bit about what we do in AstraZeneca for those of you who aren't sort of familiar with the pharma industry and then yeah like one third in, in the talk I'll talk about the conformal predictors um, so let's see if this works Okay, so the outline basically is the background then, which is an introduction uh, and a motivation to partly why I'm here at all, I guess. And then I'll talk about the conformal prediction and how we can actually interpret predictions. I'm using some example, internal um, example data sets. Uh, unfortunately, I can't reveal exactly what they are all about. And this is actually work also, also that I should mention that I've been doing together with uh, Katrin Hasselgren, who is in the audience, and I've actually done some things with Ola Spjut here as well. Um, so I mentioned that now, but uh, come back to that later. And then I'll, I'll uh, briefly touch on some conclusions I think that can be made or drawn from using the conformal predictors, and also mention what I think it could be interesting problems that for people to look at in the future. Okay, so let's uh, move over to, to the background. So we heard this morning from various talks, I think, about the, the probability of success for uh, drug projects. That uh, I, I think there were some mentions of uh, explicit numbers uh, on different phases of clinical trials. But I guess uh, the bottom line is that we need, in the industry, we need to start around 25 projects to get one successful project. And we work, I guess, with a lot of molecules early on, and then we select a candidate drug and before going into clinical trials. And uh, the costs are extremely high for doing this, and the, the development and discovery costs. Um, so within AstraZeneca, we have analyzed uh, our own internal drug projects and that has been published in, in Nature. So you see um, a cartoon or a, an image down here which shows reasons for failure at different stages and it's maybe a little bit hard to see but this sort of uh, beige color here represents safety and this is sort of preclinical phase one, phase two and uh, phase 2B, 2A and 2B I think. And then later on, the main reason is efficacy, basically. So what we did in AstraZeneca was that we went through uh, all uh, or many of the old drug projects and looked for, for the different reasons and tried to um, tackle those problems. And we basically looked at reforming or re yeah, re refining our strategy, I should say. Another thing which was a little bit embarrassing for us was that we were top of one list and that was one list that we didn't want to be in top of and that was the, the money spent for um, a drug project. So I guess the cost issue and, and uh, our knowledge of what has happened to our old projects uh, led to um, the refining or revising of the strategy. So basically we're talking about three main pillars now for our strategy to achieve scientific leadership and to return to growth, to start making money and to be a really good place to work at. So, and I guess what's, what's interesting uh, or relevant for my presentation in a way is that part, 
part of this is that uh, we, we want to um, improve or drive our productivity and improvement, but we don't just want to do that with our own internal resources. We actually want to go out to conferences and to various places and find different collaborators. So that's part of, of that model. And, and the idea is then also that we actually will be better scientifically so that we could get through the different phases of drug discovery at the lower cost and with a higher probability of success. Um, so that's sort of the main things here, I think. Uh, and then we are uh, we work in, in mainly in three therapy areas. Uh, we call it um, RIA, which is uh, respiratory inflammation and uh, autoimmune diseases. And then we also have another CVMD, which is cardiovascular and metabolic diseases, and a third one, which is oncology. But then we're also uh, doing things around CNS and pain. Uh, related diseases, uh, infection is also an area that we're working on, but it's those latter two are not sort of the main priorities at the moment. Um, and I guess one thing that we learned is that we have a lot of data, and you heard that you heard from Anne. There is a lot of data. Tudor presented also uh, different efforts that they do in, in NIH and at the University of New Mexico in looking at data and combining data in various ways. And that's, of course, extremely important for a company as well to try and utilize the data because that's, that information is basically our knowledge and what makes us unique uh, as a company, I guess. Our, our own internal knowledge. So combining that with external knowledge to also to drive our pipeline and, and to come up with better drugs faster and cheaper is important. And there was um, uh, published, uh, McKinsey published uh, something around sort of the, the evolution of big data and I guess Ola will talk a little bit more about that later on but uh, what basically needs to be done uh, to be efficient as a company. You, you would like to sort of to get up here and, and, and understand what will happen and not just look at your old data and, and see what happened. And, but to do that, um, we need to yeah, combine the data, the information, but we also need to develop new methods and algorithms uh, to, to actually harvest and utilize the data. And if we do that successfully, then there could be a real value in, in business value and business impact, which is good. So I, I, I guess Ola said that I, I worked in AstraZeneca. I, unfortunately, I didn't hear everything that you said. But uh, so I actually work in a, in a function uh, within AstraZeneca, which is called Discovery Sciences. Uh, and there are eight departments in there. And I work in, in this department called Quantitative Biology. Uh, so part of our responsibility is to try and, and use the data and do predictions. It could be in bioinformatics, it could be related to cheminformatics and, and sequencing data, any, anything really to help us understand modes of action and, and uh, new targets. So many different things. That's, that's sort of our the overall goal for our department to support our drug projects. Okay, so that was the first part, and I hope I'm okay on time because I think, yeah, it should be like one third through now. Okay, thanks. So now talk a little bit about conformal prediction and how we apply it and how we can use methods to interpret predictions uh, looking at conformal prediction. I'll start off by sort of motivating why we're doing these things at all, uh, and then I'll come into more around the conformal prediction, but without stating any equations or anything really, almost, oh, almost anything I should say. Um, so I guess finding a drug is about finding a molecule that actually would work to treat some sort of uh, disease where you would need to get into some sort of organ or tissue in an organ, for instance. And, um, and uh, interact or interfere with the processes there. So that's basically what we want to do. But the, the, the back side of things is that this molecule can actually uh, create problems in other parts of the body. So that's something that we need to use the available information and knowledge to try and rule out or understand that it, that it doesn't actually cause any other problems. 
So that's sort of the, the main problem, finding something which is efficacious and while at the same time not uh, uh, creating any toxic effects. So this example on the on the, on the slide before was uh, around something toxic that could happen to the heart. And one example, more specific example of that is, is this. So this is an image of an ion channel in the heart that regulates the um, action potential of the heart. And some compounds can, uh, can actually block this channel and, and prevent it from, uh, from letting the ions uh, flow through that. And it could be as bad as people actually dying from taking the drugs or it could be that they need to be under surveillance when they take the drugs to, to monitor that, that they don't get any of these effects and, and that in turn is then of course associated with different costs uh, as you saw on the, one of the first slides. I mean if someone dies then uh, the project is probably stopped and if you need to monitor people then it's very inconvenient to, to have that drug on the market and that is also related to higher costs. So this is uh, <coughs> an example of two compounds where, where one actually blocks this channel and uh, many people died from it and it didn't sell of course then, or they didn't make any money that company and this is another compound that actually works and, and it's out on the market and these two uh, compounds were supposed to be treating uh, allergy I think or they were antihistamines um, and there's I mean the difference between them is it's not very big so it's just this uh, group here that, that differs so that's sort of interesting. Um, can we, when we early on, when we have a, a large set of molecules, can we, can we do something about this? Can we understand whether one potential drug molecule uh, would block the ion channel, whereas another one wouldn't? And could we, could our chemists sort of design away from that in a cheap and simple way? So that's. One, one way of doing this is actually to use machine learning methods and trying to predict these properties, although they are not so absolutely correct models, but that's a, a sort of a rough way of doing it early on at a low cost. And this is something that I, many companies do uh, and that we do at AstraZeneca. Um, okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the conformal predictions and uh, what we use to uh, to build our models. So these slides before I was sort of motivating why why we're doing this. So uh, typically we would have data like this, and this is similar to what Anne showed that uh, you could find in Campbell and other places. So we have our own internal data sets. This is actually uh, an Ames mutagenicity data set. So this is a public data set. Uh, so we work with molecules or structures and then we have associated uh, um, uh, response uh, variables so dependent variables so, and those could be categorical or those could be like real numbers it differs um, so when we do the modeling then we use basically the structures as a feature or an attribute to our machine learning models and, and we use, uh, like I said before, we use the, the in this case, the categorical data as the response variable to a model. And then we also describe our structures because an image of a, of a molecule is not very useful if you want to do predictions. You need some way of describing it so that it can be used in computers. And Andreas Bender uh, explained uh, a little bit about uh, uh, wh what they use as a descriptor and attribute for, for their models, which they use chemical uh, or circular fingerprints, which is very similar to what we're using. We tend to use uh, something called the signature descriptor, so it works in a similar way, uh, but it, I guess it preserves connectivity, uh, which is different from the, or ex explicit connectivity, which is different, I guess, from the circular fingerprints. So w the way we construct this is that we, we talk about uh, having different heights, so H here stands for a height, so we, we actually traverse uh, the molecule from one atom at a time and then to a different number of neighbors. 
So, and then we call that height zero if it, we don't uh, look at any of the neighbors. And then we just describe uh, this atom by its atom type, basically. And then if we do a height one, if we start to consider the, the neighboring atoms of this carbon here, then we, we include the, the initial atom and then we just add the neighboring atom to it and, and we also capture how it binds to that. So in this case it's a single bond. And then we carry on to all the other neighbors, so in this case it only has one other neighbor. And then we, we capture that atom type and also that it's a double bond in this case. So that's basically how we construct our description of molecules and we do that for all, all the atoms in a molecule to a certain a height limit and we've done studies on what sort of relevant to be using so roughly I guess a good uh, rule of thumb for heights if, if you're interested in using the signature descriptor is to go use height 1, height 0 and height 3 and, and this is also part um, although it doesn't say on the slide it's actually part of uh, uh, the CDK uh, the chemistry development kit, the signature descriptor. So it's uh, freely available to anyone to use. Um, okay, so now we have a way of describing what uh, our molecules and we have our data in, 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 in the responses described as well. What we, what we also do is that, similar to what you see in Campbell, I mean, we have our own internal databases where we, where we store molecules and their associated bioactivity data. So we, we have a, a number of different assays to create uh, bioactivity data. And typically, we, we run them um, sort of uh, regularly. Or, and the number of, of molecules being run through these assays vary over time. It depends on the activities in different projects and, and the molecules can come from different drug projects. But this sort of represents a, a typical uh, situation over time where we have a different number of molecules being tested in, in one assay. And this also then, I guess, describes the setup because at, at any given point in time we our collected knowledge is what happened in the past basically and then as time progresses we we learn more and more about our data or our, our molecules and we make decisions based on this so for us it's ideal actually when we start to evaluate models to do it in a similar way so some of the data that I will show you here um, 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 on predictions on data set is based on evaluating the data um, in this manner, which I'll come to you, rather than doing sort of holding out test sets or doing cross validation. So instead, we use the conformal predictors, and then either we do it retrospectively or we, we do it uh, sort of prospectively uh, when we use it in live situations. So basically, if we're at some point in time, we use what's uh, colored here in, in purple, uh, we use as training data. And then we use that data for a certain amount of time to predict new compounds or newly synthesized compounds and to see what their activities are. And then I guess decide on whether they should be tested or, or what we should do with them, if we should progress them at all in, in, within our drug projects. So for, for validation purposes then we do things like this retrospectively and we, we sort of mimic that we're advancing in time and, and sort of include the, the data that we were predicting and that we have tested in, in the training set and then predict on new data and then we continue like that until we sort of get to the present time although this, it's 2016 now but uh, we can pretend. <laughs> um, okay. So for those of you who attended the tutorial yesterday, you remember uh, that validity is sort of a central concept of conformal predictors, that if your data uh, um, is, um, follows uh, an assumption which is called exchangeability, which is almost the same as anyone is using when they do uh, machine learning, they assume that the data is identically, uh, independently uh, um, uh, selected from an identical uh, distribution. So if it's exchangeable, 
then basically what you should see when you do predictions on future data is that for any required significance level, and this significance, I'll come back to that, you should observe an error which corresponds to that more or less exactly. So, you, so if you plot your predictions in relation to the significance, then it should be a straight line. And this is actually, these are predictions uh, for different si uh, significance levels and the observed errors for internal data. So that's sort of uh, data that we use uh, for our drug projects. So this is nothing that we sort of made up. So um, the significance uh, is important or is an important part of a conformal predictor. Um, it relates to the probability of this um, model of being correct. So the probability that the model actually includes the true label or the value that we're interested in is one minus the significance. So this is a really nice feature with conformal predictors that uh, no other method ha have really. Um, so in this case, we, we've been using the signature descriptor, an internal data set, and we've been using what's called a Mondrian uh, transductive conformal predictor. Um, Mondrian means that we've actually conditioned our predictions on the two different label types, which is very useful if you have imbalanced data sets, because it, it will maintain this uh, property of validity on both your labels independently, which is nice. Um, I, TCP, we mentioned that yesterday, I think we can skip that. Um, we've been using a uh, support vector machine as an underlying uh, modeling algorithm uh, with a linear kernel and uh, as non-conformity scores we've basically been using the distance to the decision boundary. Is that right? Okay, so if we look at these results in a different way, so if we plot them uh, looking at the p-values, which is the output of a conformal predictor, so for each label, uh, possible label, there would be an associated p-value. So if we plot that, then typically we'll see this distribution. And on the y-axis, we have the p-values for the number one class here. And for the, on the x-axis, we have the p-values for the uh, number zero class in this case. And, and here you basically see the distribution of the true labels uh, plotted on top of that. This one is also interested, interesting because this shows actually where we test these compounds, where we choose to test them. And it turns out that we test a lot of compounds with the predicted zero property. And in this case, the zero property is something that we would like to see in our compounds, not the one property. And that suggests that we basically can use this data to understand how we can prioritize compounds to test. So, oops. Uh, so in this area here, this is basically compounds that the model is uncertain about. And there we would like to test, I guess, to learn more. Up here, this is an area where we probably would stop these compounds. And down here, this is an area where we probably would like to proceed with those compounds without testing them at all. And quickly through interpretation. So basically what we can do also with the conformal predictors is that we can do a prediction, we can color uh, a part of the molecule and the part that contributes most to, to its predicted activity and just map that onto the atoms that, that actually does that. Uh, so that's nice. And, and this is actually data again on the Ames mutagenicity data set. And in this case, it corresponds very well to some known toxic force that were published independently in the literature. And when we have this, we can actually, uh, we have something that could suggest changes to the molecule. So a chemist could change the molecule. And in this case, this illustrates a change where actually the, the prediction, the property of that molecule changed. And that, um, and if we look, look again at the p-values, uh, this is basically what it does. So if we had the initial molecule here, then maybe that molecule was up here. So we had a high p-value for the one class and a low for the zero class. And then when we make the change, that then basically we, we transfer this molecule down to this area. So that's a good thing about the being able to interpret and to do something with yours with that compound specifically and not just knowing overall what's an important property for your molecules. 
Okay. So, how am I on time? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So the I guess the conclusions around the conformal predictors is that they produce valid predictions, and you can test that very easily, which is very good. And you, you, oops, you <laughs> press the wrong button. You uh, actually get uh, some sort of understanding of a particular compound or a particular example that you want to predict uh, with an associated uh, probability, how, how well it's predicted. Uh, and it can actually be interpreted. And around the conformal predictors, I think this is a really good source uh, if you're interested in that, to take a look at this web page. So that's a web page set up by the founders on, of conformal prediction. And I guess you will hear more about that uh, this afternoon by Paolo. Yeah. Um, so some problems that are of interest to us is, is to understand how we can actually um, refine our testing strategies and formalize that in a way and maybe even use uh, reinforcement learning or active learning uh, to do that in a better way. Another thing is to use conformal prediction more widely uh, in our applications, not just for cheminformatics. And in, in terms of the reinforcement learning, there has been some nice work done, but basically that would, instead of having the blocks that I suggested, it could be arbitrary boundaries that are, actually would define w what you would do depending on the outcome of your predictions. And I don't know if you've heard of this, but there is a, a robot that actually synthesizes compounds and tests them and, and figures out what to synthesize next based on the results. Uh, and this was done in Cambridge, I think. So. And there's been some other really nice applications for those of you who like computer games. This is actually, well, this is just a moving GIF, but it shows a game called Breakout that uh, was popular on the Atari platform. And uh, there was a paper published in early 2015, I think, about an algorithm where they actually, yeah, that algorithm learned how to play this game. And it wasn't just that it managed to sort of put the paddle in the right position, it actually started to play the game very efficiently. It tried to sort of make a passage here on the side because that create gives you much higher points by using reinforcement learning. So I think there's plenty of things that we can use from the data science domain and machine learning domain. And then, yeah, finally I'd like to acknowledge the people within AstraZeneca that has contributed to this work. Uh, and also people outside AstraZeneca that well, partly were in AstraZeneca before uh, in the audience, like Katrine and uh, Ola. Okay, so with that I stop. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.